Good morning and welcome to the webinar today. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. For those of you not familiar with Small Steps Big Changes, we're one of the five A Better Start um, funded sites by the National Lottery. Our 10-year-old funding period has been running since 2015 and the work of SSBC programme aims to improve children's outcome across speech and language and communication, social and emotional development and nutrition. The focus of today's webinar is on breastfeeding, and we can do that through co-production and collaboration to collectively improve breastfeeding, which is a local and national challenge. You will hear today some of our local learning from the Freed Your Way campaign, which highlights some of the SSBC ways of working, also the benefits of co-production and collaboration. You'll also hear from some of our colleagues, both nationally and locally, with some excellent examples of good practice. For this webinar, um, we'll be op operating it as a webinar, which means that you will be on mute and your videos will be turned off throughout the session. We're really ke keen to hear your views and voice, so please do feel free to put any questions um, in the chat as we go along. Uh, or comments. If you have any specific questions for our team at the end for the panel, please put them in the Q&A um, block at the bottom of your screen and we will try and get round to answering some of those. It'd be great if you could now just say hello in the uh, chat just to your colleagues, just to let them know who else is around in the virtual room. Once you've done that, um, we'll be handing over to MP Alison Thuis, uh, who is the MP for Glasgow Central and Chair of all party parliamentary groups on infant feeding and inequalities. And that will be followed by Jill Smith from SSBC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire, and good morning, everybody. It's lovely to join you on this webinar this morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Alison Thulis, the Member of Parliament for Glasgow Central, and I chair the all-party parliamentary group on infant feeding and inequalities in the UK Parliament. And for those of you that aren't sure what an EPPG is and what it does, it's a, a kind of collection of, of like-minded members of parliament who come together uh, for a particular cause. And this started uh, for me when I was elected uh, to the UK Parliament in 2015. Uh, at the time that I was elected, I was breastfeeding my 18-month 18 18 old uh, daughter. So it was a, a big issue for me at the time. And I held a debate on World Breastfeeding Week. And that gave me the opportunity and brought me into contact with a whole load of organisations who are really interested in infant feeding. And from that, we grew the all-party parliamentary group, and that's now been going for eight years. And over the course of this eight years, we've sought to bring various issues to the attention of the UK government to give uh, people a forum to come together and talk about infant feeding. Um, we meet sort of every six to eight weeks uh, and uh, since COVID we've been able to do that online as well and allow more people to join our meetings. And the impact of that is to make sure that breastfeeding is always on the agenda uh, in the UK Parliament. Uh, something that I was really surprised to find that wasn't there before because it is an issue that affects so many families and it's something that uh, really ought to be on the government's agenda when you think about the wider implications of uh, breastfeeding for child and infant health. We also took um, a wider view looking at inequalities as well and you'll notice it's the infant feeding rather than just breastfeeding because we appreciate that there's a whole mix of reasons uh, why people and how people feed their babies and all of those are important. And we were, what we do is we have these meetings, we bring experts along to speak on their issues, to share good practice, to inspire other people from around the, uh, the UK who come to the meetings. And I was really pleased to have the, the Small Steps, Big Changes Feed Your Way programme to highlight the good work that's been going on uh, in Nottingham. So it was really brilliant to have them come and present the last APPG meeting. And I know how enthused uh, and inspired the people that came along to that meeting were by the work that has been going on uh, in in your own project. 
We've also, over the years, we've looked at issues of inequalities, why it is that breastfeeding rates are lower in some areas than others. We've looked at issues or, um, relating to why different groups breastfeed more and less, uh, the impact of people coming to the UK and what that impact that has and their uh, feeding habits for their children when they move into a very bottle feeding culture in the UK. We've looked at the issues uh, affecting LGBT groups. We've looked at the issues uh, affecting babies themselves in terms of tongue tie and availability of that in the postcode lottery that exists. The issues that have arisen, not just since COVID, but certainly the pressures that have existed in public services um, through COVID uh, with the lack of bre uh, breastfeeding support, uh, the impact of reductions in health visiting during that time. And we've highlighted bits of good practice as well. So in Scotland, where breastfeeding was put into our programme for government, that has had a positive impact both in investment and in breastfeeding rates and making sure that that feeds through to that grassroots level in Scotland. We've put pressure on the UK government to uh, keep the infant feeding study, which is now, I'm glad to see, returning um, to the UK because that data is incredibly important. We've looked at issues around uh, peer supporters and we've looked at issues uh, around the Code and the Lancet series as well, which again, incredibly important in highlighting just how global this issue is. And we've looked more, re more recently and very pressingly in, in recent weeks about the cost of infant formula for families. And this has been a piece of work that has happened over many years within the APPG. We've produced reports on it uh, in collaboration with First Steps Nutrition Trust to highlight just how expensive formula is and how much of that in relation to the Lancet report as well is tied up in the cost of marketing. And it's quite important, I think, that we keep these things on the agenda as well, because it's not just uh, breastfeeding, it is that whole kind of issue about how babies are fed and the choices or the way in which choices are limited uh, by the culture that we have and the marketing that companies carry out. And just to highlight one particular part around the, the cost of formula, Sky News have been doing some excellent work in highlighting the impact that that has had with families um, being forced to go to uh, food banks and baby banks uh, to swap formula online in ways that could be quite harmful to the baby's health because you don't know quite what you're getting. And even some families turning to uh, shoplifting in order to provide infant formula for their babies at a time when the costs have increased. Uh, and at a time when they haven't kept pace with the, the, with the healthy start vouchers that are provided to families are not enough uh, to cover any branded infant formula on the market today. And as part of that work with First Steps Nutrition, the APPG uh, contacted the Competition and Markets Authority who look at some of these, these issues. And they reported on this yesterday to report that uh, there are issues for competition, there are issues for families. They reported that 85% of the market uh, in infant formula is dominated by two companies, which has issues for competition, certainly. They've highlighted that the cost of infant formulas has gone up by 25% in the past two years. Absolutely staggering, even with the, the inflation that we've been having. And we've had the issue that they have identified that if families were able to switch or felt empowered to switch to different infant formulas, they could save £500 a year. So they are investigating this further to see what more uh, needs to change in this particular market and the impact that that has on the choices that families can make. Turning to the, the bigger system issues around breastfeeding and why I, I believe breastfeeding is very much an issue for government. Um, people often phrase, you know, kind of uh, frame this as an issue of individual choice. For mothers you know it's, it's up to you how you decide to feed your baby without looking at the wider context in which this happens and as as many people in this uh, call will know there is that wider context about those choices are they really the choices that we think that they are because if the support isn't there for breastfeeding if you don't have the peer support if you don't have the the um the people wrapped around you to help you and support you in a very bottle feeding culture then it's not mothers that are failing it, it's mothers that are being failed as a result of that system, as a result of that lack of support. And the evidence on a kind of global level uh, is that if we have more people uh, feeding their, breastfeeding their babies, that's good for infant health and it's good for mother's health as, as well when you think about the impact uh, on cancer and, and on other conditions as well. So it's important for government to pay attention to this. And it is for government to set a lot of the rules around this and to enforce lots of the rules around this. And I'm keen, and the all-party group are very keen, 
to see full implementation of the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. Now, it used to be that the UK government would say prior to Brexit that, oh, we can't possibly implement these because of EU rules on this issue. I was never quite convinced that that was actually true, but it's certainly not true now. And if there were to be any benefits of Brexit, in my view, this could certainly be one of them that you could regulate in this issue and protect uh, our youngest citizens from the rapacious marketing uh, of infant formula companies. So I think there's definitely more that the UK government could be doing in this area. And we look to, to Ireland where they've made greater uh, inroads into making restrictions on marketing. And that's definitely something that could be considered here. And when you tie that in with the Lancet findings about the, um, the, the amount that companies spend on marketing their products, about the growth in specialist formulas, um, such as um, sort of those for supposedly for allergies, but whether or not those allergies are actually uh, there to the rate that um, companies would have you believe, hungry baby formulas, those kinds of things. All of that is money that is being spent uh, to the cost of parents at the till and to the detriment also of breastfeeding. And I was hoping to speak uh, in Parliament yesterday on an issue of public sector food procurement, because again, these are choices that are being framed to parents. So if a hospital says, this is the infant formula available to you, that's perhaps the one that the parent will continue to go on and use. And that is we know that that is tying in parents to more expensive choices uh, and it is undermining breastfeeding as well by, by uh, the marketing and the clever marketing of such products. Um, so I'm very much of the view that community projects uh, like is happening uh, in Nottingham have the opportunity to change those conversations on the ground level to normalise breastfeeding, to make sure that people see that. And the, the big posters uh, on buildings and billboards are really a good uh, positive part of that. Because if all you ever see is infant formula ads when you walk about the streets, when you open a magazine, when you turn on the television, you won't think about breastfeeding. I would love to see breastfeeding have the, the marketing spend and the marketing support uh, of, of the infant formula companies. Because we know that when that support is there, when it is normalised, when it is seen as something that happens normally, then that is something that will increase. And I wish I could remember now exactly who had said at an event several years ago that I attended, that breastfeeding rates uh, in Norway had increased and um, because of the support that was going around them uh, that had been put there for women to do that. And the person that was speaking had said, well, Norwegian women don't have different breast styles. And that's very true. So there's definitely more that can be done here to make sure that the barriers that people see are overcome, that the support is there and that investment is there and the expertise on the ground level, if that's peer support, if that's more uh, technical support um, from medical professionals, all of these things need to be in place to wrap around women, to make them uh, feel supported and able to feed their babies and to give them the confidence that when they do so, that that will be seen uh, very much as a, as a good, positive, normal thing to do. Uh, and as uh, the chair of the all party group, I am absolutely there to, to encourage that and to support that uh, and very keen to highlight uh, any issues that are that are going on right across these islands and globally where we can uh, protect, support and promote breastfeeding uh, in any way that I can. And the last uh, little bit that I wanted to say was just pester the hell out of your MPs. That is what we are there for. Um, I am always really happy when I get people in touch with me to talk about breastfeeding. Please make sure that um, your MPs know that this is important to you, encourage them to come along to the all party group and get involved uh, and make sure that this that breastfeeding stays on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Alison, and for opening up today. Um, some great comments and I think hopefully gonna be reflecting some of the themes we're gonna start talking about today. Um, I'm Jill Smith, I'm the SSBC project officer, and most of my work sits in the perinatal period. I'm also responsible for the Feed Your Way campaign and in the other part of my life, a breastfeeding counsellor. Um, SSBC launched Feed Your Way in October 2022, a public health breastfeeding campaign. And since that launch, we've had multiple conversations with different people across the country at conferences and events. We would end up in conversations after those talking to people about how they wanted to do something similar or what learning could we share with them. 
And we would end up in these much bigger conversations around the system change that needs to exist around infant feeding and to explore together what next steps should be in breast and chest feeding cities. And those conversations led us to today, a shared learning event to explore some of the things that we've learned whilst de developing the campaign, including some of the highlights from our midpoint evaluation. We also think that infant feeding is a civil issue and how many different partners and agencies have a role to play in promoting and protecting breast and chest feeding. And finally, um, we want to acknowledge we're not necessarily the experts in the room here. We are not at the end of our journey or the end of our work. We're keen to learn and share what is working well elsewhere and really welcome our other speakers who are going to be sharing some of their best practice. Core production is the golden thread that then runs through all of SSBC's work. So at this point, I am going to hand you over to Amanda, one of our parent champions, and Claire to tell you more about that. Hi, thank you, Amanda, for joining us today. Uh, you're one of the SSBC parent champions, uh, which is wonderful to have you here to give you, for you to just, um, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions just for you to tell us all about your experience. So why has co-production been so valuable? I think co-production has been so valuable, especially with breastfeeding, because it's come right from the source. You've, you've had people that have actually breastfed. You've had people that have gone through the struggles of breastfeeding, because although a lot of previous um, kind of organisations and when you're advertising breastfeeding being the best, they kind of do the glorified part of it. So they have some really beautiful woman sitting on a, a sofa looking all pristine. And I'm sure some people at some point for five seconds may look like that while breastfeeding. But for those of you who are breastfeeding, we know you're often stood at a bus stop, you're sat on parks, you're you're sat on the sofa in your pajamas, you've probably got spit up on your shoulder, your hair's not been done and you've forgotten what makeup is, let alone what it looks like to put it on. Um, so I think it was the realistic terms of what breastfeeding actually is. Yes, it has amazing health benefits, but the fact is sometimes it can be hard. Yes, it, you get, you get the, you know, the, the, the joy of breastfeeding, especially knowing you have, but it, it's not all plain sailing. And I think having co-production of explaining that and knowing that we wanted real parents with real views. We didn't want some model sitting in front of a camera posing at breastfeeding. We wanted people that had actually been through that, had experienced that and know the feeling of that, both the good and the bad. Um, and also we wanted it from a variety of different views. So we didn't just want the, the white privilege, white woman from um, kind of a heterosexual couple sitting on a sofa telling them how their perfect little world had gone because the fact is families are not made up like that anymore it, they, it's just they, they never were to be honest but that's how the advertisement always made it we have same-sex couples who are having children and breastfeeding we have ones where you're living with sisters or mums and they're now your support group you have ones where you have stepdads um in the picture so it's it was kind of from all those points of view and I think it made the the impact bigger and better because we co-produce right from the beginning. We weren't sat in a separate room, you know, in case parents self-combust when sharing their views. We, we were in there with the other professionals designing how Feed Your Way was going to go. That's, that's great, thank you, that's really helpful. So you've, you've um, mentioned some of it, but in, in your head, why is it important right from the start of a steering group to be involved and to be heard? So it is, because it just saves time. I'm not going to lie. The biggest one for me is it saves time. We get so frustrated um, as service users when we're when we're co-producing of you bring us an idea you've already half formed. And then we're like, well, that's that's not going to work or that's not how we thought this was going to go. And then we spend about another three or four meetings going back and forth. Whereas when you're there at the beginning, you can put your idea across. You can say how, you know, the public is going to react to something that because you're not there to do your pitch. You're not there standing at the side of your billboards explaining why you use that word or why you put that picture up there or why this went that way. It's got to be an instantaneous, when you look at that picture, when you see those words, the feeling that you get when you look at those. And that's where the co-production aspect comes from me because service users will give that. They'll give that open. They'll give it honestly. They don't care if you fire them. You haven't hired them. So it's they can be sometimes brutally honest 
about what is the first thought that comes to mind. And sometimes professionals, they don't want to insult colleagues, which is fine. They don't, obviously don't want to be fired. Again, that's fine. But we kind of don't have that barrier. Um, so we can often say what a lot of the other people in the room are thinking without the kind of the repercussions that could come from that. That's really helpful. That's really helpful and something that needs to be taken forward, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to hand over back now to Jill. Um, so Jill Smith from SSBC, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the um, Feed Your Way and the learning. Hi again. And, and just to, I think, back up what Amanda was saying there, is I did receive some very blunt feedback from her when we were developing this campaign in particular about the hairstyle of, of one of the images of mothers we'd pulled from stock photography. So um, that was a, a that is a very real telling of um, parents involvement in some of this work. So I said earlier, this work for us began with the Feed Your Way campaign. And I'm gonna share some of what we have learned from that so far. I'm just trying to move my slides along. Okay. Okay, so Feed Your Way, an SSBC commissioned a public health breastfeeding campaign. It's set out to encourage positive attitudes and challenge negative attitudes around breastfeeding. It was to increase support for breastfeeding and chest feeding in public and workplaces, and to increase awareness of the value of breastfeeding and normal baby behavior. Um, so some lofty goals there for a small piece of work. We were really keen that the conversation needed to be extended beyond parents and the baby. We felt this was an issue that involved multiple partners. And to that end, it was co-produced with a wide group of stakeholders. Many of them are with us today. That included public health managers, midwives, infant feeding leads, health visitors, peer supporters, and of most importance, the parents. It was a loud, active and vocal group who contributed at every stage. This was a commissioned piece of work and we worked with a, um, a particular organisation with um, a background in behaviour change and how that was applied to marketing campaigns. Um, there was significant public consultation. So one part of that was a countywide survey with 1,800 respondents. That led to focus groups and, and creative testing with families who offered to get further involved. One of the key messages that came through, and it's really important for us to keep coming back to, were that parents were aware of the benefits of breastfeeding, but health-based messaging and risk-based messaging was not landing well with them. It was shutting down conversations around infant feeding. So as I say, with that information in hand, behaviour change theories were applied and a campaign featuring beautiful local families and their stories was launched in October 22. If you haven't seen those lovely films, there's six of them and you can see them on our website, feedyourway.co.uk. Little plug for the site there, but they're beautiful. They're well worth watching. Okay. So our commission providers undertaken a midpoint evaluation of Feed Your Way to look at the reach and the effectiveness of the campaign. This evaluation included a further survey and focus groups. So what have they told us? The Feed Your Way campaign is landing well. The majority of people responded positively to it. It was clearly identifiable as a breastfeeding campaign and it was described as non-judgmental. People who had either experienced breastfeeding challenges and had to stop breastfeeding or who'd opted to formula feed didn't feel excluded because of the Feed Your Way name. And why is that important? The majority of babies in the UK receive infant formula, whether that's through parental choice, mixed or combi feeding, it's part of their experience, as is expressing and offering breast milk in a bottle. And it was really important that we were able to try and address that group. Our research and our families had told us that an all or nothing attitude to breastfeeding wasn't helpful. And as we all know in this room, all parents deserve evidence-based information about how to feed their baby and support that should be offered without bias to ensure safe and responsive feeding, whatever that milk is. 
the inclusion of responsive bottle feeding information can support parents to follow their feeding cues and develop attachment, which is another one of our priorities as an organisation. And as Alison already spoke about so eloquently, the cost of living crisis deepens and information about infant feed milk free from promotional claims is vital and it is shared and accessible through our website. People didn't feel excluded because of the flexibility within the Feed Your Way name, and that's something we're really proud of. Our areas for future development, we need to increase the reach. When the campaign materials were seen, they were well received and appreciated. And materials were shared at bus stops, at tram stops, on some digital boards in the city and on the front of our beautiful council house. However, street level advertising like that is expensive. Formula marketing is a $77 billion industry and we were far from having that budget. So we need to consider different methods of reaching families creatively and economically as we move into the next phases of our campaign. Our greatest allies in that are our workforce partners in Nottingham and future phases of the campaign will explore greater collaboration with those partners. Um, some of those partners are in the room today, so I hope that's not too big a surprise, but we can have some conversations in the future. We've already seen displays of the images in some of the maternity areas at Nottingham University Hospital, where families are waiting um, between their appointments and you know, options like that are things we need to think about for the future. Engagement with the business community and city employers has always been part of the plan. It was always going to come into phase two, but our evaluation has highlighted the need for this. Thinking about a breastfeeding friendly scheme, the need to prioritize information for families around feeding and public, but also support for employers to support their staff and how they're going to manage feeding in the workplace. Um, and something that's really interesting for SSBC, increased representation of fathers. We know fathers, father figures and supporters can have significant role in the initiation and continuation of breastfeeding. And fathers were included in two of our case studies, but they were supporting players. And we need to tell a story where the father is the centre stage and how their experiences are part of that infant feeding journey. Some of our challenges that we need to consider as part of this evaluation, SSBC alongside other A Better Start sites, funding term closes in March, 2025. Services are dealing with issues of capacity, resource and budget. Street level advertising, as already mentioned, is expensive. Continuing the campaign and seeing those phases through is to be explored locally, but funding is going to remain an issue going forward. Diversity and representation in our research. That initial survey, 1800 respondents, that's fantastic. As perhaps should have been expected, they were predominantly white women in their early 30s. Our midpoint evaluation was supported by a recruitment function to try to diversify that sample. And the audience we reached had significantly less pre-existing interest in infant feeding in order to address some of those biases. We would like to work more with a middle group. That group, our initial research previously identified as the swing voters, those families who may change their behavior as a result of exposure to the campaign where we seem to have been having conversations at either end of the spectrum. So that's something we need to work on as we go forward. There's also something about the experiences of other communities. SSBC works in four wards. Two of those wards have more diverse populations and better breastfeeding rates, but they're not necessarily represented or present in conversations around in infant feeding. There is a paradox within breastfeeding um, white people are most often seen, but have lower breastfeeding rates. And we need to do better here. We need to engage more and learn more that we can bring into the campaign. We also have balancing different needs of families in the stories that we tell. So I mentioned fathers earlier. Fathers have asked in their feedback to us for more positive concept, content 
They were concerned and worried when they heard about some of the difficulties and challenges involved in infant feeding. Yet our research has told us that that information needs to be front and centre, which has been supported by some research being done by Northumbria University on the role of fathers in breastfeeding. So we need to look at that again. Where is the right balance? What is the male lens on that conversation? Some respondents asked to see images of younger babies being fed. The act of including older babies and children in this was an act of choice in the campaign. So there is some conflicts there to work through for us. And for example, we have a bolder color palette. This was tested with families during the design phase, but some people did wonder where are the pastels? Where's blue and pink? Um, because that is the kind of way they were used to seeing an infant feeding conversation. So these are all things that we're gonna think about and how do we challenge traditional stereotypes without um, alienating people. And the next phase of this is thinking about our legacy and ending well. So we've mentioned that the SSBC term is coming towards its end. We're very concerned at the moment. We talk a lot about what do we leave behind? And for us, how is Feed Your Way to be embedded into our local systems? Which is a lot of what I am exploring at the moment. What is Feed Your Way? It's a public health campaign. It's a website with a set of assets. I've got posters, there's a website, there are visuals, there are downloadable resources, but it's become more than that. It's also an approach, it has a voice. It's evidence-based, it's without judgment, and it sits in a space between meeting the standards around baby friendly and the WHO code, and trying to have a broad and inclusive approach to infant feeding. That approach, as you can tell, has been rooted in co-production and the key messages that we get from parents. Risk-based health messaging are not well received. People want to hear about realities. They also want to hear solutions. They don't want to hear the benefits of breastfeeding. So we want to work out where does that voice go because it isn't just the website, it is that message as well. As a public health campaign, it has raised the profile of this agenda locally, put parents' views into strategy decisions, and it's provided opportunities to continue these conversations about infant feeding in other spheres, including um, carbon neutral work in the future as well. So with all that, we need to try and share our learning. Midpoint evaluation is having its final proofread and the I's are being dotted and the T's are being crossed. An external evaluator has also been commissioned and is in the first stages of evaluating how the campaign engages with workforce and wider systems. This evaluation will of course be shared and we'll be working on sharing that evaluation and embedding this learning into whatever comes next so that future phases of this work can continue in our city. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Jill. That's very helpful and very informative. Uh, we're now delighted that we have the Breastfeeding Network here today. Um, we are going to start with a 10 minute video from about ecosystems of influence and support uh, with the CEO, Catherine Hine, followed by Nina White, who's going to actually talk about um, the Breastfeeding Network. I'm going to hand over to the video. Hello, my name's Catherine Hine. I'll let my colleague Nina introduce herself a little bit later. And just to say that we're really delighted to be able to join you today in order to really share the learning that's coming out of this important programme in Nottingham and Nottinghamshire and Feed Your Way. Um, and hopefully to share some of our own learning around that ecosystem of influences that's impacting the choices that parents and families make around infant feeding and some of our own responses to that in the forms of the support that we offer. So after some brief introductions, I'm gonna put some of those infant feeding um, influences in a wider context of support. We've got a, a, a model that we'd like to share with you, which shows some of those influences at different levels. 
and our responses to that, as well as some kind of wider learning on each each of the um, responses that we have and some of our plans for the future. First of all, though, um, who we are. So um, I am the chief executive of the Breastfeeding Network, but perhaps more importantly, um, I grew up, I studied in and I now live again in Nottinghamshire. So when you see engagement on some of the, the posts around Feed Your Way, you can often see me getting particularly excited because I am a Nottinghamshire person. Um, my background is originally in international development, in community development. Um, I've done a lot of work as a commissioner, as a donor and a local authority manager, and I've also led some healthcare innovation work um, together with NHS England. But I think perhaps the main thread in my previous work is around inequality and poverty. And I was really drawn to the profound um, impact that inequalities in breastfeeding information and support can have. And Nina is, will introduce herself a little bit later on. But needless to say, here we are, both of us with our newborns. Um, we both have lived experience of being parents and of breastfeeding. And that's obviously quite central to the support that we provide. So Breastfeeding Network, um, we are an organisation that is really specialised in infant feeding and peer support. And I think joining from a very different sector, I was really struck by the, the huge emphasis that we place on quality, on evidence, and really an uncompromising commitment to putting parents and families first, um, which is particularly evidenced, I think, by our supervision structure, by the, the training, the ongoing commitment to CPT, the fact that um, all of our training is, is um, accredited and um, I think in terms of that kind of uncompromising commitment, we see that BFN is repeatedly kind of making decisions to forgo funding and forgo certain partnerships in order to um, really make sure that we are compliant with the WHO code on marketing of breast milk substitutes. Um, we provide evidence based and quality assured information and support to around 1.56 million service users per year. And that's based on some data from last year and does include um, our drugs in breast milk fact sheets, which are probably our most popular service. Um, so many of our services are run by trained volunteers who, as I said, um, undergo quality assured training. Um, they contributed 33,000 hours of volunteer support um, to fellow parents last year. And I just wanted to say at this point, a couple of points around inequalities. So first of all, um, when I say we support parents, we support all parents. And in the, in the interactions that we would have in our service delivery context, we would always use the terminology that families themselves choose. Um, so that might be chest feeding in a service delivery context. Um, we also um, respect and support uh, families, whatever infant feeding choices they're making, and that's assuming it is a choice. We realise it isn't always. Um, I think in our day to day communications, we talk about women because um, we know that some of the most underserved communities are communities facing high levels of deprivation and that it's really important to have clear language that's understood by the communities that we're trying to reach. Um, we also do ask in our communications with government and donors that breastfeeding gets a look in really because we know first of all about that profound inequality in certain areas of deprivation that breastfeeding rates are so much lower than in other areas but also we recognise that actually without government input on breastfeeding and support to breastfeeding it doesn't really stand a chance um, against the um, commercial formula companies who can obviously put millions behind their marketing practices. Um, so I'm going to move on and just to put, um, so I mentioned about putting, putting infant feeding influences in a wider context and maybe some of you will already be familiar with this World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative. So the World Breastfeeding Trends Initiative gathers evidence um, and we're actually going through a new assessment at the moment. BFN is, is part of the assessment um, committee. 
Um, but these are, this is based on 2016 data. So you can see here behind um, a snippet of a, an England report card, and there is one for each nation of the UK. Um, but ahead in front of that, you can see um, a rather small graph. Um, this ranks 100 countries. And you can see an arrow towards the bottom, which is showing where the UK falls on that ranking from 2016. And we're in 67th place. So you can see that there is some way to go. And I think what this highlights really is that when we're talking about that ecosystem of influences impacting the decisions around infant feeding, you know, the UK, based on some evidence evidenced criteria of what good support looks like is not doing too well nationally and um, there's lots of room for improvement and you can see this is across a whole suite of areas this is around the coordination between different stakeholders it's around the training that healthcare professionals and others receive who are part of that infant feeding journey um, it's about the maternity protection in the workplace um, it's about specific and tailored support for emergencies or for hiv um, Across the board, really, there's room for significant improvement. And let's hope that when this next round of data comes out, that we're moving up from 67th place. So this is based on our own experience of working with um, families and some of the feedback that we get both through our services and through the, the research that we're part of. And this is where we see um, key influences at a range of different levels. So at a community level, at a regional or county level, a national level, and even at an international um, level, all impacting on some of the choices and the, and the experience of breastfeeding or infant feeding that a family will have. And you can see possibly that this this does come from feedback, some, but some of some of the influences you can see may not always be very explicit ones. So particularly when we talk about the infant formula industry, when we're hearing from parents, they're not necessarily recognising that the infant formula industry is playing a huge role in, in their and, and impacting their decisions. But in reality, they could be looking at an influencer's Instagram account potentially on a totally unrelated topic and see you know bottles being normalized in the background or they could be impacted by the fact that the infant formula industry is part of a dairy sector lobby and then influencing maternity provision in a country which we've seen happen in ireland um you know so so some of that some of that influence is insidious and it's not necessarily going to come out from parent feedback which is why that range of data really providing that insight on what's influencing choices is so important but you can see that there's a lot of different influences here and some of them are obvious they're what we'd expect and some of them may be less so um, I think one on our radar particularly at the moment is schools because obviously some of our deeply held beliefs about what's normal form at school age. So um, we are starting to look at how we engage more on breastfeeding and infant feeding with, with schools as well. And then in terms of, so I've already started to talk about this, but how we respond to that. So as Breastfeeding Network, based on that learning, you can see that we've developed our offer. Um, these green arrows reflect um, that um, we're working in a whole range of different ways within this kind of ecosystem, really responding to those different influences and trying to prov provide better quality evidence based information and support so that ultimately that does reach um, the reach the family and, and helps them make the best decisions for them. And you can see right around the edge that there is this there are these kind of circular arrows arrows really indicating how important training is at at almost all levels and i think as you'll hear from nina shortly training is probably a kind of key theme coming out in terms of our learning that 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 training is required at so many different levels and not always just with healthcare professionals or directly with families themselves so i'm now going to pass over to nina who's going to talk more about some specific examples of our uh, responses and the learning that's come out of that. Hello, my name is Catherine Hine. Hello, my name is Catherine.
Hello there. Thank you ever so much, Catherine, for that video. And um, thank you to the local team for giving us the chance to talk, talk to you today. Um, as Catherine said, I'm Nina. Um, I've worked with the Breastfeeding Network now for about 14, 15 years. And yes, that was a picture of me with my newborn uh, 16 long years ago. And I looked at it and thought, gosh, don't I look tired? That is very normal, as you know. Um, wanted to fill you in a bit more on, on how we support parents at all levels of the community. So thinking about the, the image you've seen earlier, the big round circle, um, and, and starting really with our breastfeeding friendly scheme. Over the last year, we've had significant organic growth in our breastfeeding friendly scheme. Um, last year in March, there were 172 venues signed up. And now there are 445. Um, we haven't really done a huge campaign. We haven't pushed this scheme. It has been a very organic growth. We work really closely with the Scottish Government to advise and contribute to their Breastfeeding Friendly Scotland scheme. And in some areas, we're commissioned by the local authority or the NHS to deliver breastfeeding peer support. And we've developed schemes and localise the branding of the breastfeeding friendly scheme. So volunteers that we have in our services in Islington, Derbyshire, just over the road from you, Stoke, Southampton, have enjoyed going out to, to visit and recce new venues such as cafes, shops, soft plays, leisure centres, and sign them up to a local scheme. In other areas, we're not delivering a peer support service, um, but there's still been great interest in becoming breastfeeding friendly as councils and venues realise the value that it has. In Nottinghamshire, the seven venues, so you may know them, the National Civil War Centre in Newark, uh, Southall Minster, Beth Treadle's Gymnastic Centre in Mansfield, Eastwood Primary Care Centre, Hunter Douglas Retail, Creative Hands Childcare uh, and Sweaty Mama in Nottingham. Nationwide, we have some very big names for our, our breastfeeding friendly scheme, Buckingham Palace, the Visitor Centre. We had a fantastic time visiting there and training members of staff. Um, a prison, eight theatres, five libraries, eight RAF bases, 40 GP surgeries and 20 museums, including Bletchley Park and Eden Camp. Interestingly, although we do not provide peer support services or training, we've had a significant coverage in Hull with 65 separate venues signing up and Bridlington with over 100. So the spread throughout the UK is much wider than our peer support services. But what have we learned from the Breastfeeding Friendly Scheme? The venues want to sign up. They really do see the value for their customers. So Ian, one of the owners of a cafe in Bridlington said, I signed up to the scheme straight away as breastfeeding is promoting the health of future generations. And I want mums and families who visit my cafe to feel 100% comfortable when a baby needs to feed. I already have a changing area for families and this scheme was perfect in expanding the family environment I already provide to my customers. The Breastfeeding Friendly Scheme provides a scope for supporting other services to reach families. For example, signposting them towards the National Breastfeeding Helpline and also local peer support services. The level of growth needs a bit more input and governance to ensure venues are inclusive and fully trained on parents' right to breastfeed. We want them to know where to signpost families to, both locally and nationally. And our branding on posters and stickers means it's our reputation at stake. So we want to support uh, venues to get it right. We have developed a free to access induction fam uh, package for the venues, and we're currently improving and working on feedback from that to continue to evaluate it and adapt it to support them to ensure staff make breastfeeding friendly happen in reality. The Drugs in Breast Milk Information Service. As many of you will be aware, most medications come with a warning on the packet that they must not be taken by breastfeeding parents. For those of you that don't know, 
we at the Breastfeeding Network run the Drugs in Breast Milk service to ensure that no parent is ever told they need to stop breastfeeding to, to enable them to take medication. We know that misinformation about, me about medication is a reason for early cessation of breastfeeding. If a drug is not compatible with breastfeeding, our pharmacists are able to suggest alternatives and provide the evidence behind the research. This service is always free of charge and available for parents and healthcare professionals. Our website has a library of 75 fact sheets, all of them free to download. And last year, over one and a half million different users access these fact sheets. The top few being antibiotics, cold remedies, decongestants, moist wound healing, antihistamines, analgesics, constipation, sore throats, anxiety, all very common ailments. Yet so many people are told they must not take medication because they are breastfeeding. As well as the fact sheets, we have a team of pharmacists, 19 of them, all volunteers, answering emails and social media messages. They had answered over three and a half thousand last year. And 87% of these were calls coming from parents asking, can I take this medication? Do I need to stop breastfeeding? Will it harm my child if I take this and then breastfeed? And what is the alternative? Our recent evaluation of the service showed that if mothers had not received the information the service provides, many would not take their prescribed medication. So rather than stop breastfeeding, but sorry, they would, many would not take their prescribed medication rather than stop breastfeeding. GPs often assumes mothers will stop breastfeeding, but in reality, so many value breastfeeding so strongly, they would rather put their own health at risk in order to continue doing so. Obviously having a profound impact on maternal mental health, as well as maternal and baby's physical health. The key learning point from our evaluation came from feedback from healthcare professionals who told us this was a much needed and unique service, which enabled them to provide more accurate, trusted and up-to-date information they often did not have in training or updates from other services and sources. Thinking about how we support families, all our peer support, all our peer support services are different. No two areas have the same offer because we work in partnership and we co-create our services with local communities. Across the whole UK, we run the National Breastfeeding Helpline, which is open every day of the year for parents, partners, health professionals to receive a listening ear and evidence-based information and support. In areas where we're commissioned to provide breastfeeding peer support, for example, by local authorities and the NHS, the services we offer are varied depending on local need and interest. For example, we run breastfeeding dropping groups, antenatal classes, bedside visits on maternity wards, telephone, tech support, home visits, video calls, and online groups. We have social meetups in cafes, walks in the park, but most importantly, we work with local partners to reach families that wouldn't choose to attend a breastfeeding class or group. And we take the support to them at different community groups, play groups, the school gates, local parks and soft play. Our volunteers gave over 33,000 hours of volunteer support last year. We find that this is filling a gap between the public breastfeeding messages of what you should be doing and actually what to do, how to do it, what to expect and what is normal newborn behaviour. We've learned that one size most certainly does not, not fit all. So what we need, what, what we ask, we ask what is needed and most importantly, we listen. We've learned that our staff and volunteers are our most valuable asset and our training is accredited with the Open College Network. So all our volunteers and staff receive an award which can open doors to further training and employment. 
Some volunteers go on to work with us or within their local NHS, which leads me to my next slide. We offer a variety of levels of training to suit the whole support ecosystem. Thinking back to that diagram with the donuts and the circles that Catherine showed earlier, our courses fit into each layer of the community. Some are a basic light touch introduction and some are more detailed, clinical and accredited. And we understand that everyone has their own learning style. So we try to offer a variety of courses, some in person, some in a group, video calls, video calls in groups or one-to-one, -one, and others are self-guided online courses. They're not all academic and essay writing. There's a lot of group discussion, pair work, small group work, research, role play, and importantly, self-reflection. Breastfeeding Friendly, we talked about earlier, includes training for the venue staff so they feel comfortable signposting to support and understand why it takes our whole community to support breastfeeding. Community champions would be the next step aimed at people who work or volunteer with families to enable them to confidently signpost or refer families to peer support and to offer a listening ear and a warm welcome. First Milk Matters is for staff who work in local authority, NHS um, or venues with families, a short two to three hour course to increase knowledge and awareness about breastfeeding. It empowers families to make informed choices about their feeding their baby. We share evidence about why breastfeeding is important and help people to think about what they can do to support breastfeeding in their own work venue or community. And outcomes from the training are an increased understanding of why breastfeeding is important, an understanding of what how breast, make, breast milk is made and what can interfere with this, knowledge of how breast milk differs from formula, and increased knowledge of the cultural different issues and barriers relating to breastfeeding, and understanding how individuals can support breastfeeding, and an increased awareness of where to signpost families for breastfeeding support. We also have a course for GPs to provide them with information about all the above, plus medications, prescribing for a breastfeeding mother and referring for specialist breastfeeding support. There's also a 12 week course for other healthcare professionals, such as midwives and health visitors and doulas who have training in infant feeding, but perhaps not the level of detail required to provide evidence based research and offer a hands off style of support. Our accredited courses for peer supporters have two levels, helper and supporter. BFN training is open to all women who have personal experience of breastfeeding their own babies. It's open to mothers of all ages and backgrounds to enable them to widen their knowledge, skills and experience to support breastfeeding within their communities or remotely. The first level, helper training, equips you to support parents at a community group setting on a maternity ward, covering topics such as how breast milk is made, normal newborn behaviours, filling that gap again between what we're told we should be doing by public health messages and actually what to expect in reality. Um, we cover confidentiality and boundaries, of course, efficient positioning and attaching the baby for feeding, expressing milk, and counselling skills to enable you to ask questions and more importantly to listen to the parent and what they want. During the second level training, supporter, you would develop these skills to work more independently, perhaps offering one-to-one -one support and to offer phone support on the National Breastfeeding Helpline. And on to our final slide, our actions based on our learning over the years. The more data we can gather about who we're supporting, where and how we're supporting them, what topics they want to talk to us about, this all helps us to evidence what we do and what is needed. This helps to secure funds to ensure our local offer helps to address health inequalities. We aim to be inclusive by design, 
and involve local communities so our offer is true peer-to-peer -peer support. Finally, we need to work with local authorities with a long-term plan. As we've seen here with Small Steps Big Changes, it takes time to get to know an area, set up a service and begin to see what works and adapt. We know we need to manage expectations about what is realistic and how long it will take for an impact to be seen. Some commissioners want to offer a peer support service, but only fund for one year at a time, making forward planning impossible. Partners really need to be ready, willing and able. And we continue evaluating our work every year, every month, and learning and adapting as we go. Thanks ever so much for your um, time this morning, and I look forward to any questions later. Thank you very much. That was wonderful, Nina, for that comprehensive um, explanation of what you do and all the wonderful things you do. That's marvellous. Um, if anybody is interested in adding any questions into the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, please do that. And if you would like a specific member of this panel to answer, if you could highlight that in your question. We have picked one or two up from the chat. But if you could pop it in that way, it just makes it easiest for us to manage. Any of the questions that we don't get round to asking, we will, of course, get back to you and email you with any response that's required. In the meantime, now I am delighted to welcome the Sheffield Family Hubs with some of their examples of the work that they've been doing. We have Rachel Yafai and Kayla Thompson, who are community early help professionals for infant feeding. And they will hand over to Claire Robinson, who is the project lead for breastfeeding in Sheffield. Thank you very much. Hi, sorry, we just had some technical issues as, as it started um, and I don't seem to be able to get the, um, there we go. Oh my goodness, In, all the technical things have gone so well today apart from ours, so I apologise. It's not working at all. Thanks, Alice. So my name is Kayla and uh, this is Rachel. And we are early years community practitioners for Sheffield Family Hubs. Um, the Sheffield Family Hubs, we have seven across the city and we are Start for Life services um, that are committed to enabling uh, the best start for parents. So we offer help. It's recently changed when we became family hubs rather than family centres back in July. And we've changed from 0 to 5s to 0 to 19s or up to 0 to 25 with uh, SEND needs. Um, so we are a trailblazer. Uh, we have been, Sheffield has been awarded the trailblazer um, side of things with regards to the um, Start for Life um, and we are the only authority, local authority in Yorkshire and Humberside who've taken on the infant feeding strand of Start for Life. So as well as that, Sheffield is, um, we are signed up to the UNICEF Baby Friendly um, Award initiative. And we have Nawal Elmrani, who is our BFI qualified leader and the project lead for the UNICEF Baby Friendly for Sheffield City Council. Uh, we gained the gold award for UNICEF a few years ago and we are now going for reaccreditation. Um, we uh, we adhere to their uh, responsive feeding uh, of um, young children. So Sheffield has a peer support service and they have paid peer supporters that we have um, set up and it's been running for around 15 years March next year so over the 15 years it has grown and our 
infant feeding support workers. Um, they support new parents um, and they're often the first contact within the family hub service. So um, we give information antenatally and postnatally following the UNICEF guidelines. Mm -hmm. And our aim is to ensure that all children get off to the best start. We work collaboratively with all midwives, health visitors and any other professionals uh, around a family uh, offering non-clinical and emotional su uh, support. They do refer on to all clinical needs. Um, and this is our infant feeding team. We hold an annual uh, get together in the Sheffield Winter Gardens every year for National Breastfeeding Week. And this was the one last year. Our role of the infant feeding worker, as I said, we have approximately 30 infant feeding peer support workers across Sheffield. And they work within the family hubs and then satellite um, services. So there's three main areas that they do. The first one is that they will contact all pregnant women in Sheffield uh, when they are antenatal to offer information on feeding and caring for their baby. And they do this a number of ways, whichever is best for the mom. Our preferred way is face to face. Um, so we will attend midwifery clinics. They will hold face to face uh, groups within the family hub. Um, we do them virtually as a face to face virtual group or individual or over the phone. So it's really up to the family and what they want. They will contact all moms. We're really fortunate we get the information from our local hospital, Jessops, around all moms that are discharged within 48 hours. And we will we will call them all up regardless of their feeding choices. Um, and we will also then follow them up at 10 and 21 days. They facilitate uh, breastfeeding support groups, offer one-to-one -one face to face or telephone support. They all our infant feeding workers run a breastfeeding support group. Um, these are out in the community or in the normal family hubs. And um, they also deliver baby massage groups to encourage bonding and networking for all mums. So it's not just around breastfeeding. Anybody gets to attend those. Um, so antenatally, what they will normally do is they will contact the families around 28 weeks to introduce the service and offer an antenatal conversation. They'll talk to the mom around what the family hubs are and what they're available. They'll then talk to them about a preparation for birth and beyond group uh, that we run, which is a five week antenatal course run between um, the council and the health assistant team. They'll discuss the benefits of breastfeeding and the support available postnatally for the mom. So hopefully get them um, to get the best start for both mom, parents and babies. And they'll do joint home visits to introduce the service so with to the uh, health professionals or do joint home visits. Postnatally the families they're working with should have contact within 48 hours of being discharged from Jessup's or hospital if it's not a local one um, or following a home birth. The, we are still working to get everybody there are sometimes people are missed so we do rely on our partners to let us know if they come across a mom that's been discharged and she's not had contact, they will email in to us and let us know. They should be offered telephone support regardless of feeding choice. Um, and if the mom is struggling with breastfeeding, the infant feeding support worker can contact them, sorry, will uh, support them with position attachment. They will speak to uh, formula feeding moms around things like responsive bottle feeding, how to make up formula safely and paste bottle feeding so that they can make sure that they're still getting the information out there. But um, our main support and thing is really um, on the uh, the breastfeeding side of things because we do understand that they need to protect it more and it doesn't change for our formula feeding mums. So they then call the mums at 10 and 21 days. This is as our minimum um, and the additional support actually is there until the mums decide to stop feeding. So they will help with them initiate, continue, they'll talk through them that weaning stages when they're returning to work um, and then eventually when the mum decides to stop if she needs um, support with that. The infant feeding support worker, peer support workers, sorry, they've all had um, 
a successful breastfeeding journey themselves. That's one of our reasons that we actually they become uh, arrested and one of the things um, and they go through quite intensive training within our breastfeeding um, with our breastfeeding lead Nawal before they start. Um, the When they're doing the groups the run by the infant feeding worker but we also have a breastfeeding volunteer service within Sheffield that Nawal runs and quite a lot of the volunteers will support our breastfeeding groups and if for any reason an infant feeding worker is not there or they can also run ensure that it's run so again all our volunteers are breastfeeding mums within um, themselves about a successful breastfeeding journey and we do try and keep them within the local area so hopefully they're more representative of um the um of the the more representative of the area so we do just like they are a paid it is a paid service for our infant feeding workers and then as i said we also have a, a voluntary breastfeeding network so our infant feeding workers peer support workers are paid um there are a few limits and boundaries of our infant feeding support workers so there's a few things that they can't do the first one is that they can't put a feeding plan in place or change feeding plans for the healthcare professionals they can't teach cup feeding and they can't suggest or diagnose tongue ties um so or any medical issues so our infant feeding peer support workers are not clinically trained and they will always refer to the lead professional as needed. Okay, thanks, Kayla. So that was an introduction to our infant feeding peer support service provided by the local authority in partnership with the health service in Sheffield. As part of Start for Life funding, there are some newer posts. And Kayla, Lauren and myself, you can see on screen, are our community early years practitioners for the infant feeding service. Um, and there's our background there. So Kayla's a very, very experienced infant feeding peer support worker. Um, and I trained as, as one of the volunteer breastfeeding peer supporters that um, Kayla mentioned. And Lauren, unfortunately, can't be with us today for family reasons. Hi, Lauren. Um, we'll be presenting her work she's leading on around education and schools and her backgrounds in teaching. So... Um, there are three main projects funded by Start for Life, which we are working on and leading within the infant feeding service. Um, so the main one is to help with improving participation of underserved populations. I know that's been discussed a few times previously by the speakers. Extension of the service, um, improving access to the service and working with schools and early year settings. Um, we've got this referrals inbox that uh, we're using locally within Sheffield. Um, just hold on one second. So that is a new, that is an extension of the service. Um, so that's for wider professionals and practitioners to refer in for infant feeding peer support workers for any families they're working with. Um, anyone pregnant or postnatal. Uh, we've even had some self-referrals when people have emailed family hubs a weekend and that's come through to us that we deal with on a Monday morning as well. So that seems to be working quite well as another way into our service. So, so one of the things that we were saying about the um, the additional things that we are doing, this is on top of the normal standard start for life uh, basic, I forgot what they're called there. Uh, yeah, points. the standard uh, guidance in family hubs and start for life guidance. So Sheffield was already meeting loads of those already. That's what we call a business as usual. And then part of being a trailblazer is that we're working on the go further options. Um, as you can see from the three projects there, it's these kinds of strands that we're leading on. Um, so within the underserved, we have just recently launched a brand new antenatal young parents group um, that and we are also starting a myth busting group that is hopefully aimed at the wider family so we can get them all together antenatally and start identifying the myths and getting rid of them and that's just to say that's specifically targeted at areas with lower breastfeeding rates so there's a dem demographic angle with that relating to the data we have in Sheffield about breastfeeding rates and we've worked very hard with our materials that we're going to use in those pilot schemes to have the kind of plain language which Catherine from Breastfeeding Network mentioned earlier is really important for certain communities um yeah yeah um we are looking at increasing the service into the evenings and weekends and the methods of delivery including social media 
but that's probably going to be something that comes later on uh, rather than one of the ones that we're focusing on immediately due to just staffing levels and the funding and things. And a big area that, as Rachel mentioned, we're gonna be doing is working with the schools and the earliest uh, settings. So the, yeah, so so Lauren um, has doing, is doing loads of work, loads of research leading on developing curriculum materials and workshops to go into schools, looking at areas such as biology topics. So normalizing breastfeeding and human milk as part of what we do as mammals, um, looking at personal health, health and social education in terms of the impact on the environment of different methods of infant feeding. Um, so really looking at improving the education offer there. It's not something we've got in the English national curriculum as opposed to our colleagues up in Scotland. And if any of you were at the uh, UNICEF Baby Friendly Initiative Conference in Harrogate last week, you've had a really good presentation from leaders in Scotland there about all the education work they're doing right from early years so that young children, primary age children are very clear about breastfeeding, the benefits of breastfeeding and that that's normal um, and that those all those rights about feeding in public, et cetera, should be protected. So we know there's something there about education. Um, so we want to launch some pilots here in Sheffield about seeing if, if we can make that work, introduce that and see what impact that has on breastfeeding rates in the longer term. So we're going to start with our secondary schools. That's where we're aiming at. And Lauren's developed three different uh, programs that the schools are going to be able to pick from um, and as I said we're hoping that if we manage to get biology or the reasons why we should breastfeed into schools then when it comes to the parents actually being pregnant then we can start with how to have a successful journey not why they should breastfeed in the first place. So that's the theory behind our uh, starting with the older ones because we think they're going to be the ones that we can have them biggest impact immediately because as everybody said we've only got until 2025 for the funding before so we've got a time limit on our things so uh yeah then the finally if any of you do have any questions and you want to actually get in touch with the infant feeding team you know that that is our email address um we we do monitor that daily so it is for our partners and professionals they email in with any questions and support needed for a mom um but uh yeah um so um Um, just to address Teresa's question about funding, so the funding, it's national government funding, Start for Life, which then comes through to the local authority, so it's through public health within Sheffield City Council. But our infant feeding service is actually funded by the Sheffield Department of Health, um, so our business as usual is funded by our Department of Health and the additional funding that the three of us are working on our things is to the Start for Life so we have two different funding strands at the moment. Um, is there any other questions that have come through that wonderful? So um, we're going to now... Um, oh. Right, so we, I think that's just been... I think, are you handing back to me now, girls? I think, yes, yes, yes. I think we are. Yes, Lovely. Thank you, very much. thank you very much for that. It was very informative and I'm sure we all gained a lot from it. And some of the questions that were in the chat have actually been answered. So that that's great. Thank you very much. Obviously, we've only got about 10 minutes left um, for the rest of the session. Um, so what I would like to do now is just to... Let's see anything now um is is um have a look at some of the questions that have come in um and actually put those out to key key people we've had a, a quite a long question from joanna brett um so i'm going to read it out i think some of it has actually been answered before so i'm going to aim this one at jill from ssbc uh, if she could just pick up the bits that she thinks is relevant to her um Joanna says, I wonder if somebody could talk a bit more about how you're working with other health professionals. Having facilitated antenatal breastfeeding sessions and supported parents with feeding babies for more than a decade, one of the greatest challenges I find is preparing parents for the gap between public health messages about breastfeeding and the reality of their conversations with some highly qualified professionals who have very limited understanding of breastfeeding. So that is quite a, a long one for you. Jill, but I think you can see it as well. Yes. Um, 
Yes, um, some of that work is we have some great professionals working in Nottingham. Um, we've got health visitors, we have nutrition peer support workers who are specialists in supporting our families, um, working in the communities. And we've also got pregnancy mentors and our infant feeding staff in the hospitals. Um, sometimes conversations do need to be done differently. And I think that will be part of the work that we're developing for the future. Um, but with Feed Your Way, what we do is we consistently feed that information in at a strategic level. So for us, it's always about representing the parent's voice and that information and talking about having conversations differently at a strategic level. Um, what that looks like in future phases is something that we're working on and we'll hopefully have more information about it in our final evaluation. That's great, thank you. Uh, we'll just have another question and then we're going back to Claire, if that's all right, just for her to give us a quick roundup from Sheffield. So the, the second question is to Nina and it just does, uh, uh, and it is, how does the workforce access the uh, breast How does the workforce access the breastfeeding network training? Um, two or three ways, really. Uh, the first point of contact would be to um, look on our website. We run some training that um, individuals can book into, so they can look on our website at the training at the professionals training section. And on there, there's Eventbrite details of upcoming um, sessions. Or they can contact us on our email project at breastfeedingnetwork.org.uk, and I'll put that in the chat in a moment, um, to discuss with us more um, personalised, unique for their service. And we will work with them to put together a training package for them and what they need locally. That's great. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, we'll now just go back to Claire Robinson, who is the project lead for breastfeeding in Sheffield. Just give us a quick update on um, the work that they're doing around Sheffield. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name's Claire, and I'm just going to talk to you very briefly because I'm conscious of time around uh, what we've done to make Sheffield a breastfeeding friendly city. Um, I'm going to give an overview, and if anyone wants any more detail, please don't have hesitate to contact me directly. So um, this is the signage that you would see in Sheffield around the city, um, proud to support breastfeeding mums. So this has been changed recently. It used to say you are welcome to breastfeed here, but obviously um, mums are welcome to breastfeed anywhere. And we've done a lot of work around uh, raising awareness with mums of their right to breastfeed legally. So um, the new wording was actually voted for by mums in the city themselves, proud to, proud to support breastfeeding mums. So uh, initially, a few years ago, um, a report was commissioned by NHS Sheffield and it identified some of the barriers to sustained breastfeeding. And as you all know, um, it confirmed that many women feel anxious or embarrassed about breastfeeding in public places. So in Sheffield, we chose a coordinated partnership approach. The local authority, including the community-based peer support service that you've just heard about, NHS Sheffield and many other key partners and mums themselves. Um, and we've all worked very hard together to, to remove barriers to breastfeeding. That has involved lots of regular meetings where we, um, we discuss sort of our common themes so um, initially uh, we thought we, we'd come up with a, a brand and breastfeeding in Sheffield is the most obvious one um, based on what we thought mums would search for um, when they were looking for information. So uh, we created um, logos and posters and signage all with this name. Um, this is consistent throughout the breastfeeding journey. So it starts with mums uh, in hospital where they, they're given information in their discharge pack and it follows them through into the community 
uh, into the family hubs and then um, through into local businesses and organisations. So the first thing that we, we wanted to do was to um, collate all the information around breastfeeding together into one place. And we wanted this to, to um, so this website, we wanted it to have reliable and accurate information for mums. There is so much information on the internet and out there that isn't correct and, and accurate. So we created breastfeedinginsheffield.co.uk um, you can use the QR code here to go straight to the website to have a look at it, although you'll hear in a second that we are currently developing a new website. Um, we also wanted to engage with mums who um, don't necessarily engage themselves with local services. So um, we developed social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and it's interesting how that has progressed really with the initial emphasis on Facebook is now more on um, on the other two. Um, and we are working on a, a new website at the moment, um, mostly streamlined than the, the one we currently have. And we're widening the approach to breastfeeding in South Yorkshire. So we're bringing on board their Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham, um, and we'll have shared information. So the social media we use um, to give information on the benefits of breastfeeding, how to breastfeed, and all the other common breastfeeding the themes. We try to um, include sort of the wider support that mums have and target some of the information to, to dads, partners, parents. Uh, we use it to raise awareness of the mum's right to breastfeed anywhere they choose and the support that's available throughout the city. Uh, so we, we give information on how to engage with those services. We also um, promote our breastfeeding friendly venues, which I'll tell you about shortly, and other initiatives that we have in the city to normalise the image of breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. So breastfeeding campaigns, we've used many over the years, many different methods of trying to uh, normalise breastfeeding. Uh, these are our focus on feeding posters, um, and these provide information on uh, things such as breastfeeding outside of the home, weaning, how to get support, breastfeeding in public places, building a happy baby, responsive feeding. Um, we hold public events, we, we try to celebrate National Breastfeeding Awareness Week and um, we've done things such as putting on breastfeeding fashion shows, showing mums how to, um, you know, what clothes to wear, how to breastfeed in public um, as discreetly as they want, as they choose to. Um, we run social media campaigns and we often try to engage mums. So we, we ask for breastfeeding friendly ambassadors and secret shoppers, um, asking them to go out into the community and um, take photographs of themselves breastfeeding in public places and uh, to do a review of, of what's out there and how supportive they were of them as breastfeeding mums trying to breastfeed there. So the Breastfeeding Friendly Award Scheme was a big chunk of the work that, that we've done to make the city breastfeeding friendly. And so what we start, what we did initially, we sort of started from the ground up. Um, so we looked at um, areas in the city that were underrepresented or um, where breastfeeding rates were low, and we targeted venues in those areas. So places where mums didn't have to pay anything to go to, so libraries, uh, community centres, and we moved on to leisure centres, sporting facilities, cafes, restaurants. Um, we use the window stickers that I showed you previously, um, because when we, when we um, ask mums for feedback, they still say that they look for the, the window stickers to give them the confidence to go somewhere and, and breastfeed in there. They know that although they have a legal right to breastfeed anywhere, in these places that we call breastfeeding friendly, um, that venue goes above and beyond and um, they will be supported there. Um, 
And we provide support for businesses and organisations to become breastfeeding friendly. So that may be just going and having a look at the premises and um, talking to them about what they can actually do to support breastfeeding mums. Or it may be a full training package for um, one of the universities in Sheffield or um, larger organisations. Um, training their staff on on what they can do as individuals to support breastfeeding and to help anyone who is visiting their premises. So, as I said in the last slide, we started from the ground up, but then we started to think, actually, we really need to set the standard here as the local authority and um, and start looking at what we're doing and then trying to encourage other large and small organizations to follow our lead. So we developed a new citywide breastfeeding policy and then we took a report to cabinet um, a couple of years ago, just before COVID. And we got that passed um, uh, through cabinet to say that Sheffield is a breastfeeding friendly local authority. So we got, um, buy-in from um, the all the representatives within the local authority from the um, unions, HR, um, procurement teams. And so now we can say that all public spaces, all local authority public spaces and workspaces um, will be breastfeeding friendly. And that in includes having breastfeeding champions um, uh, that pe that anyone can contact. Um, for example, if you're an employee of the local authority and you want to return to work and, and continue to breastfeed, there will be a breastfeeding champion in your workplace that will help you to do that, help you to liaise with management and um, help you to engage with supporting the city and to an allow you to continue breastfeeding as long as you choose to do so. This um, also uh, states that all new contracts with the local authority, so all our partners and providers will be required to be breastfeeding friendly and have a breastfeeding policy. And so we will work with these key providers and partners um, to do that and provide whatever support they need to support um, their own workforce and to be breastfeeding friendly public places as well. And hopefully uh, by doing that and um, promoting what we've done there as a local authority, then we'll get other organisations in the city to, to come on board. And that's everything uh, from us in Sheffield. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. That was really, really informative and you're doing some marvellous work there. That's fantastic. I know we're running over a little bit, but we do have time just for a couple more questions. Um, we've had, um, before we, we sign off and say goodbye and thank you, um, we have got one from Dee. Um, I'm going to aim this at Jill. Um, Jill, do you have uh, the breastfeeding rates? Have they improved with the campaign Feed Your Way? Well, I have an answer, but it's an answer of not yet. Um, we do need to do some work to increase our reach, D, as we said earlier. But with regards to the rates, we'll be tackling that when the final evaluation of the work is done towards the end of 2024. One of the challenges we do have with that is at the same time we're running the campaign and working with colleagues, We've had family hubs money come into the city. We've got some increases happening in the provision of services. So how we separate out what has influenced what with regards to the breastfeeding rates. Um, yeah, we've got a piece of work to do to get that clarity, but we're hoping to do so next year. That's great. Thank you very much for answering that. The next one is for Nina. Um, Nina, it's a question about during the current climate, is it harder to recruit volunteers? Yeah, this is something that we're seeing up and down the country. We're finding volunteers uh, either needing to return to work sooner um, or maybe they are part time, but they're having to pick up extra hours or maybe go full time. So we are finding it harder to recruit. But what we're trying to do is make sure that volunteers know that they don't have to only volunteer at a group on a set weekday. There are lots of other volunteer activities. They might be providing um, 
preparing our social media posts. They might be making phone calls um, and text messages to mums. Evening and weekend activities, uh, groups, socials and what have you. Um, but key for us, we have noticed, is we've always had budget available for our volunteers. They've not always needed to, to um, accept and, and claim those expenses. We're beginning to see that there is a definite uptake in claiming expenses. Um, volunteers, it sounds like they're free. We did 33,000 volunteer hours last year. They are not free. They need training, supervision. Um, and expenses paying. So we just make sure that we've built into the budget with our commissioners, um, volunteer expenses for their travel, um, any refreshments they're providing to make sure they're not out of pocket and making that very clear when we're recruiting trainees for volunteering that they won't be out of pocket. That's great. Thank you, Nina. I think the next one is for you as well, Nina. And I think we might make this one the last one. If if people have not had their questions answered, we will get back to you and answer some questions for you. Um, the last one was from, this is from Anonymous. Um, how do these promotional activities engage with families and communities who don't speak English? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure Jill will say similar for, for Nottingham, but we do a lot of work to translate and interpret uh, our work. So we have um, our phone lines in a number of different languages as well. We have voicemail so they can leave a voicemail um, or message an email into us and we will get um, interpreters or we can translate resources. We do an awful lot of work locally in our service areas to find out what languages are spoken and ensure that our messages are put out on posters and um, that our health professionals have all of our resources in locally spoken languages. Um, really, really keen to make sure that people are not missing out on information because it's not in their language. That's amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, I think to close the event, we'll just say that any um, the, the the event pack and the posters um, that have, will come from Nina will be posted onto our website so you can all access them afterwards which is uh, great. just want to say thank you very much to everybody to attending but in particular to Alison thank you very much for spending some time with us today that's been fantastic. To Amanda you're vitally important to us thank you. Um, to Katie, Alice, um, Hayley, Jill, Kayla, Rachel and Claire and Nina. Thank you very much for all your help and your support. Thank you, everybody.